Good evening, my name is Steve Seitz, and if you're on this channel, then you know the show you are watching is Book Talk. My guest today is Richard Duvall, a first-time novelist, and he has written a techno-thriller. Uh, Richard, if you could hold the, uh, hold the book up and maybe have the camera over there. The uh, book is titled The Ox Factor, and it creates a hypothetical future about 20 years from now, in which the U.S. gets into a, quite a big scrape with China. So uh, Richard, if you could, uh, uh, be actually before I go any further, you, you, everyone should know that uh, I helped Richard with the manuscript on this book and I edited it. So, you know, that's, uh, that's out there just so you know my role. Anyway, uh, Richard. Steve, Steve was a big help to us. The book would not be completed without having had his help. And of course we thank him very much for that. But uh, the book really had its genesis. Uh, while I worked in China many years ago, I started to go to China on a regular commercial basis in 1982. And uh, I spent about 14 years commuting back and forth from America to China. And in those years, I get to get a sense of the magnitude of the Chinese people and a sense of the magnitude of their civilization. And uh, they are really, really different than we are. Um, I don't think people can really understand without having, without having spent a lot of time there, how different they are. They're not bad, they're not terrible, they're not good, they're not great, but they're different. And when I saw the awesome strength of the inner core of the Chinese person from the 400 years of civilization that they've had, or 4,000 years, yeah. I should say. Um, it, it dawned on me that the 21st century was going to be a crossing point between America's stature in the world and the coming stature of China. And this book is really a metaphor for the 21st century. And it explains in a metaphorical way what would happen if China and America came to a collision? And in this book, the way we manufactured it, uh, we, meaning myself <laughs> and my wife, uh, the way we put it together was that China actually decided to invade America and take it, take it as a prize. And the ensuing conflict that evolved after that decision. And in the beginning of the book, it opens up with a, a very incredible, ingenious attack by the Chinese on America's defenses. Yes, I think that's fair, that's fair to say. So um, I could tell you the whole story of the book right now, but I don't think everybody wants to read it. I think they want to save it for when they have a chance to read it themselves. But in the very beginning of the book, there's a, a fleet exercise of the American Pacific Fleet. And the Chinese attack that exercise in a secretive way. And what they do is they destroy all of our communication satellites. And we have no idea what China is doing to our fleet. Even our lady president in the White House has no idea that this is happening. And her, her people in the, in the Joint Chiefs of Staff don't know what's going on. They haven't heard from, from any of their men and they can't even find the, the Chief Admiral of the Navy because he's off somewhere trying to figure it out himself what's happening. And our fleet is mainly sunk. And it's at an incredible cost. It's a thousand times worse than Pearl Harbor was in 1941. And, um, it's kind of a sad time, and it was very difficult to write that part of it because, you know, I remember December 7th, 1941 very well. I was listening to the radio when I heard the news of the attack and uh, kind of stayed with me all these years. And to recreate it in another way, even though it's fictitious, was kind of a, a shattering thing. And it kind of raised the hackles on the back of my neck while this was happening. But the only two vessels that survive this attack are two American submarines. 
and it was a lot of fun to learn about submarine warfare and the men who work on the submarines they, they, they call themselves the Bubbleheads. But anyway, these guys, Dick Braille and Bill Soderberg, each one commanding a, a different type of a submarine. One's an attack submarine and one's a missile submarine. But the two of them work together and they escape the big, big battle. They escape by hiding behind the, the sunken carcasses of American ships, including the great American aircraft carrier, which was sunk. They had to use that for cover because the Chinese were furiously looking for them. And they finally fled after sinking a few of the Chinese ships themselves. Uh, they, had to, they couldn't leave without you know, letting them know that they were there. And they, they fled to Australia. And the Australians greeted them royally and gave them a lot of support. And they gave them the directions of what the American government had asked them to do to give to these submarines. So, and they, could, they play a much greater part later in the book. So that's the opening. Yeah. You had to do an awful lot of research to, you know, to get everything right. You had to go into electronics, you had to go into computers, military strategy, and the whole bit. How did, how did you go about doing that? Gamers, hackers. Well, I had friends in the, who were retired uh, submarine men, guys who were bubbleheads who had been in submarines. Not many of them, two or three guys uh, that helped us out, one guy more than the others. And, um, but they had the information on the lingo and the, what, what, what the submarine guys talked about. The other people, I have grandsons who were uh, very conversant with the computer world today, uh, video game games, uh, you know, the war games and stuff like that. Nintendos, etc. I can remember the, the my youngest grandson's playing with Mario. Who, <laughs> yeah, who he was, whatever he was, and it was all a mystery to me. But eventually, they were able to give me the the, the information that I need, and then essentially, it was creating the right people for the job. And the, I think one of our best creations was Ox. Mm -hmm. And Ox is, uh, I really. <laughs> can't tell anybody before they get into the book about Ox, except that Ox remains a mystery to both sides, the Chinese side and the American side, for quite a way into the book. And eventually, Ox uh, kind of gets together with the most important person in America, who was Elizabeth Rutledge, who was a woman vice, woman president in America. And she depends a lot on Ox. And it took her a while to find out who Ox is. And of course, the woman president has a, has a wonderful character for a son, a boy named Finn. And this lady is a widow from, her husband was killed in Iraq uh, in that war. Um, but she's a stand-up lady. Her dad is in the, is in the, uh, White House with her. If he had not been born in London, he might have been president. But we got a good bunch of people in that book. Uh, Ox's father, for one, and uh, Ox's brother, and Ox's sister-in-law. Uh, so uh, they're, they're really a good staff of people. And as you get into the book, you meet more and more of the people in America who come to the defense it's almost like an instant guerrilla operation was formed throughout America. And working together, we can only give you parts of it in a little book like this, but uh, they did a tremendous job in carrying out the wishes of the American president. And her speeches are probably some of the more eloquent parts of American literature today. Uh, anyone who wants to see the, the what women can be and what women can do and the leadership that women can do, that's nicely delineated and dramatized in this story. So why did you decide to go with a female president? Uh, there, was, there was really no doubt about it. Uh, it's part of this idea of the book is following a trend in history and I feel that 
we may have a woman right now, I would feel that we might have a woman president before this book takes place, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm at least trying to stay ahead of the curve on uh, what happens. And um, I, I, I think that even though uh, we may have a woman president sooner, I think that this lady may, may stand an equal to whoever that might be. Maybe. <laughs> we never know. This is, this is your, your first novel ever. Yeah. Uh, why did you decide, you know, have you always been writing privately for yourself? Do you just like to write little stories and put them away? Or? I wrote little stories to send to my grandsons, and they were born in 1982. The first two were born, uh, one in January and one in December on Christmas Eve in 1982. And those are the years that I was traveling in China. And while I was in China, I felt a good way to write to the boys, which I wrote them letters quite frequently, and made up stories about the, some of the things that I saw in China and did in China. So they still have those books, and someone here illustrated them for them. So there's a little file of, of books where I really wasn't trailing my hand at writing, I was just writing to my grandson, but it turned out to be stories. And my wife and I had a better breakfast uh, in New York on Long Island and up here, and we had guests for 30 years. And it turned out that after the 30 years were over and looking at the, the writings that the people left in the book, they said they really enjoyed the stories that our host was telling us why we were there for breakfast. So I was labeled a storyteller by people who are guests of our better breakfast. I didn't realize I was such a storyteller until that actually happened. I did major in English when I went to university, but that's a long, long time ago, and it really mm -hmm. didn't have a big bearing on it. I didn't learn to write, you know, any mm -hmm. professional way. I didn't go to writing school. I didn't have any of that training. It's just, a, you know, came from a family that loved to hear the stories. Well, that's where it all begins, isn't yeah. it? So tell us a little bit about your time in China. I mean, you, you, you were there, you, you were there for Tiananmen Square, I remember that. Yes. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and what you saw there? Uh, the uprisings in China in 1989, which became known as the Tiananmen uh, riots, um, that they actually happened on June 4th of 1889. I, was, I had gone to China for an extended trip at the end of May, and mm -hmm. um, I happened to be in Hefei, which in the, is a, a province, in, it, 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 Hefei is a leading school city in Amway province. It's A-N-H-U-I province, and Hefei is a leading city with the colleges there, and that's where the disturbances really started. The, the struggle for democracy came out to the, into the streets. And during that, I had been to Hefei earlier and heard some of the conversations that the kids were having. Kids, I'm talking 20-year-olds, 22-year-olds. Yeah. These weren't teenagers. And at the time <clears throat> the struggle really burst out in Beijing, I was working in the city of Nanjing on a special project. And we were on the second floor uh, having a a lot of the restaurants in China are upstairs. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but they just like that. And uh, we were in a good restaurant having lunch. And I had my little camera with me, which I sometimes carried, sometimes didn't. And I, we heard a lot of noise outside. So people rushed to the windows to see what it was. And there were thousands of young people with banners were coming through the main streets of Nanjing. And I reached my camera and took it out the window, and one of the people with me said, pulled my arm back, said, don't do that, don't do that. They're taking pictures of every, everyone that's here. And I, I put my camera back, I didn't want to get into trouble. But I saw these students marching, and I said, what's this all about? And they said, well, there's a rebellion of students, and it's, it's running all over China. And we've heard from friends in the north, we've heard from friends in the south, and all the cities are having these demonstrations. And that's really just all they were at that time. Now, the, the train ride from uh, Nanjing to Shanghai, which my home base was, uh, I had gotten that evening or the next day, and 
uh, when I get into the station that night, and this is now early, very early June, like the first or the second, there was rioting in the Shanghai train station. And I knew my way out the back way, so I went out, I hailed a taxi, and he was a little bit frightened about taking a, mm -hmm. uh, a Westerner, a person with round eyes is called Guai Lo, mm -hmm. uh, taking a Guai Lo someplace, but he, he, he agreed it was all right. So he took me back to my my little pad pad that I had in Shanghai, in the Jing'an uh, area, and uh, the the loud noise was getting louder. And later that night, I had heard that the 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 uh, station was set on fire, and the people were coming into our little hotel to listen to the news because. There was no local Chinese news, but they could get CNN with their antenna mm -hmm. in our hotel. So uh, the, not everybody, but, but teachers and businessmen who had access to the hotel would come in to watch CNN so they know what's happening in their own, co in their own country. And before long, the mayor of Shanghai, whose name was Zhang Xiemin, and I had met him a couple of weeks earlier, and I was surprised at his great knowledge of English, and he praised Thomas Jefferson. He read Thomas Jefferson in English, but he had complimentary things to say. But his speech that night was uh, to the people of Shanghai, if you don't go down there and stop the rioting at the train station, you're all going to be destroyed by our forces. We will not tolerate this. And mm -hmm. he was a party member. He later became the president of China, yeah. Zhang Xiemin. And uh, so he stopped that. Uh, the next morning I flew up to Harbin, which uh, is a, a city in Heilongjiang province. It's one of the northernmost cities and one of the cities that has a lot of Soviet influence to it. You go to the restaurants and half the food or uh, menus are in Russian. And the, the river that goes through uh, Harbin is called the Stalin River, which is, we know who that guy is. Uh -huh. And, uh, but we kept hearing about what was going on down there. So I, I was able to get back from there to uh, Shanghai and where I was expe expecting to get a plane. But the day I got back, uh, we had, just seen all the rioting up there. And a kid named Jimmy Mulvaney, who was a, a friend of ours from high school years, um, it was the chief editor of Newsday in Hong Kong at that time. And he had, when this thing started, he got himself up to the, because he held two passports. A Mulvaney always can have an Irish passport <laughs> and an American passport. So Jimmy Mulvaney went to the Irish Embassy up in uh, Beijing so he could find out what was going on there. And he had called where my phone was. I had given my phone number to him so we could always be in touch with each other. I filled him in what I had seen at Shanghai and what, and he was telling me what he was seeing in, in, uh, in, in, um, in Beijing at the Tiananmen thing. And he went down there to see it, but it, it was so huge he couldn't really get his arms around the whole thing mm -hmm. as to what was there. And there weren't enough people who could give him legitimate information. And his last words to me was, he said, there are going to be probably 10,000 casualties. I do not know whether that ever really happened. And I have never found out from Jimmy whether he had an actual count. But this was just a piece of news that he was reporting as a, as a you yeah. know, qualified piece of news. It wasn't exact perfect information. So I, I don't think it ever got back to Newsday. But at that time, uh, June happened on June 4th. And if you say June 4th today in China, that's all you, they need. They, they know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's like our July 4th or, you know, yeah. our December 7th. It has meaning to them. Uh, I left China finally. I left Shanghai on the 17th of uh, for a flight to Hong Kong on the 17th of June, which was about two weeks later. And when I went to the airport, it was very interesting. There were half a dozen young guys, uh, probably in their early 20s, that had these large yellow bags of 
canisters of film. And they said, would I please take these to Hong Kong for us, for them? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the guards, the security guards and the, and the people who were check you out, uh, the frontier guards, they were called in China, they didn't stop these kids at all from giving me these big mm -hmm. bags of things to put on my lap in the plane. I put them behind my seat. And sure enough, when I got, we flew into uh, Kai Tak Airport in Hong Kong, um, I dragged these bags across and as I walked down the aisle, three guys came right up to me and said, thanks for delivering it. Give me a handshake and hug goodbye and, and that was it. So I was a courier. Uh -huh. Too briefly at no pay, but just uh, <laughs> thrilled, thrilled to be part of something that was bigger than one of the biggest things ever in the world at that time, and perhaps it still is. I uh, went back to China several times after that, well into the mid 90s, before I stopped going to China. Mm -hmm. I got around to places like Chengdu, which is the furthest west I ever got, uh, Canton, which is uh, Guangzhou and Xi Chang and Tianjin, and a number of times I was able to take my wife with me, and we got up to see the, uh, see the uh, uh, Great Wall. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found out every time I went to Beijing, uh, my room was, was uh, tapped, uh, they had uh, cameras everywhere, and whenever I would go down to get a cab to go someplace in the city, uh, in Beijing. Now this is in 89 and 90 and 91 and 92. Um, the taxi guy would always say I had to wait over here till he could get the right cab for me. Mm -hmm. So this puzzled me. So I had to wait a while to find out and ask some questions. But what they were doing, they were calling the head security people in Beijing that there was a, a Westerner, a Guaylo, taking a cab and they had to get, turn their cameras on. And on top of all the, the traffic poles in the entire city of Beijing, mm -hmm. there are TV cameras, which would then pick up my taxi cab, because they would have the number on to know where I went. But you were there on a comp on private company I business. Was, I had right. my own company, and I was trading in uh, textiles then, and my, my work job was to go to factories and purchase bed linens, flannel sheets, comforters, uh, pillowcases, towels, mm -hmm. uh, bath towels, kitchen towels, napery, which was, the kitchen goods were napery, and uh, all, the, all the things for the American market. And these were things that were not normally made in America, and these were things that I already had orders for. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy anything on speculation. I didn't buy anything to ship into a warehouse and then sit and wonder what I was going to do with it. I always had orders in, in my pocket, and then my customers knew that I was acting as, in effect, as an agent for them, but I was buying on my own account. I had a, a credit rating with Chase Bank for $20 million, and uh, my financial partners provided that. I did not, because I'm not that rich. <laughs> so I had- Oh, well, you're a writer, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. I'm a pauper. So I was acting like a rich man with rich man's credentials, but that was because of my silent partners in America who were also had offices in Hong Kong but, uh, and who also spoke several different languages. So I was lucky to have the right, the right partners to do the work that I loved uh, over there. And I had a grand time in doing it. Um, I never learned to be fluent in Chinese, uh, but I do know a few phrases that would get me by on train travel and you know talking to waiters and things like that and um, made a few friends over there and um, so all, all in all uh, there were probably 27 or 30 trips back and forth across the ocean to China and I can remember the first time I crossed the Pacific it was on a troop ship during the Korean War and I left from Oakland on a ship called the General Rose and it was a troop ship that had 8,000 men, and we went to Oakland for duty in Korea. And it took 18 days to get from the Pacific coast of America to Yokohama. And I thought about this when I was writing the book. Uh, and coming home from, 
from Japan in 1953 uh, on another troop ship. It took 20.